Eric. She's the head coach at Wesleyan um, School. And how long have you been there? Uh, eight years. Eight years. So she is going to slip in until Tim Godley can be here. Thank you for, for working. Yeah. Now you can get to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I like presenting about as much as I like to do that. Well, <laughs> well, she's studying for program. Uh, does anybody want? I'll pass that. Ms. Carter. And are you ready? Yes. Oh, I'll never say it. So first off, I had no idea how much youth would be here, so this is a little bit more tailored to exactly what we do with our varsity girls. And a lot of it entails also how we get our youth leagues tied into our varsity at a really early age. Um, a little bit about me, I went to Milton a long time ago when it wasn't a really fancy school. Um, I then went to Georgia Tech, and literally when I walked into this room, I sat in the seat by accident <laughs> that I used to sit in for class. And then I sat down and I was like, oh yeah, this is the youth league, you can't wiggle too much or everyone will look at you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to Georgia Tech and then I coached and started the middle school team at Westminster under Jay Watts. And I was there for probably five, five years. Um, ended up at Wesleyan and when I came to Wesleyan, um, I was definitely setting a new culture for the program. It was not um, a very serious team before I came in. And we lost a ton of girls during my first couple of years, and that's just kind of part of restarting a program. Um, but now I've been there for eight years, and we've grown a lot in the program, and I'll talk about some of it. But if y'all have any questions, like I love questions during presentations, so if you want to know like how would you consider that to a youth league, just raise your hand and ask, or just shout out the question. Um, okay, so first a little bit about Wesleyan. Um, Wesleyan is a Christian school and that is ultimately our number one mission is to spread the gospel to our students and hope that they then go into the world and spread the gospel to other people as well. Um, in the high school we have 500 students total and my first year we probably had 60 girls that were interested in coming out and seeing the new lacrosse <laughs> Um, and then by the time conditioning went through, when we started the season, we had version one, in case of varsity. Um, and then now that we are kind of in a much more normal pattern, we have 40 to 45 girls every year in the high school program between the JV and the varsity team. Um, our middle school team, which is also on campus, which gives us the opportunity to do a lot of unique things with our middle school program, has 24 girls between the seventh and eighth grade. Um, and that has been pretty consistent for the past three years. And our middle school coach is here. I'm going to make up for a lot. Um, and she and I, like she has been with me since the first year I got there. And having a really solid middle school coach is literally what is allowing our high school program to be so successful. Um, also, our girls are pretty overwhelmed in terms of like, because we have 500 students and we offer almost all of the same opportunities as the bigger schools in the area, um, our girls are expected to do like something every single season. So I think with those 45 girls that are in the high school, we have anywhere from two to the season of January to May. So we really do have to extract and get the most investment from them as possible from January to May because as a coach who works at Wesleyan, I am totally realistic that they are not going to have the time to do things out of season. They do, um, most of them do cross country in the fall, uh, they'll do swimming in the winter. If they're not doing swimming or basketball in the winter, they do this thing called Omicron, which is like a service league where they are required to stay every day, just like a practice after school, and go to local charities in the area and do stuff like that. So it is a lot to ask them to do fall ball or to do a club league. The ones that do are pretty serious about playing at the next level, and again, it's usually two or players out of the 40, it's a very small percentage. Um, okay, so the things that I've had five things that I just wanted to talk to y'all about. The first one is being relational. If you can get your kids really excited and really invested emotionally, they will give you so much more on the field and at practice and just in terms of building a program. And then being excited as a coach, I have a couple books in there that are really inspirational and get me super excited about the opportunity of coaching every single year. Um, and then expecting the best from your players. They want to please you for the most part. Um, they are excited about reaching really high goals. So setting the bar really high and then just watching them get to it. Are they going to complain along the way? Absolutely. But that gives them an opportunity to like bond with each other. 
Um, and then we do a lot in terms of trying to develop our girls as leaders before they leave the program. And that's where you'll see a ton of our youth stuff kind of stepping into the program. So that picture there is an opportunity for our JV girls to actually coach the youth league that runs through the Gwinnett Lacrosse League. Um, and they come on campus and do like a little halftime game during one of our big varsity games. And the JV will be the coaches, the girls will play during the halftime. And it's called our spirit night. And we give away free food to all the kids that show up. Um, and they really enjoy that a lot. And then loving the journey. And then just a couple of things to implement. In terms of implementation, like if you take one thing away that you want to do, for me, that's like a huge win. Um, so the first thing is, just building those relationships and knowing, like this book on the left, my husband read it. My husband makes it. It's like a, a really easy thing. I hate to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and both of the books that are in here are like super short, um, so you could read them over the break before you get your season started. Um, but in that book to the left, it's written by a it's a previous Falcon coach, um, and he has like the seven Ps of building a successful program. And the first one is just connection, like having a connection with your players, whether they're connected to each other or they're connected to you as a coach. Building connections leads to commitment. And the most successful teams that you see at the highest level all have that investment of connection and loving each other. Um, and then the second thing is called, we call it the bucket. Davos Ganey calls it the safety. We call it the bucket because on the first day of practice, we didn't have to teach. And so we flipped our ball bucket over and used the ball bucket. And then after each student does this little building activity, they sign the bucket um, and then keep it for the whole year. Um, so what the bucket is, and this article that's down at the bottom, uh, Andrew can probably send this out to y'all so you don't have to write down the link. But the article talks about that Dabo has this sheet that he makes every single player in his program sit in. And they have to answer, he covers them with questions about their life story, who their heroes are, what are defining moments of their lives, what are the most challenging moments that they face in their life, and then at the end, you get to open up with questions where the whole team can ask that person questions about really anything they want to. With the high school, we talk about it like, you know, this is a safe environment, we're not going to talk about this outside of this practice at this time. And really, honestly, like, the questions don't get that deep in this moment. <coughs> But as a coach, I always like try to take notes or write things down about my players that I want to follow up with them later. Um, and so like you might hear a student say like, oh, my family life is really hard. And they're not going to say why because they're standing in front of 25 people. But you have that chance to like follow up with them afterwards and like, well, you know, I should have said something and trying to get that one-on-one -on -one conference conversation later. Does that make sense? Um, and so it is great. It also gives the girls a really great opportunity to talk in front of an audience, just like I'm talking in front of y'all now, which can be really nerve-wracking. And they get really, really nervous about doing this. But it is great practice for later down the road when they're going to have to talk in front of other people. Um, so that is a really great activity. We started it, I think we started it two seasons ago that we started this. Um, and they, it definitely gets better every time you do it. Um, we also have the coaches do it first. So the coaches give like a preset of kind of what it should really look like. Then we have our seniors start next, then the juniors, and then it like trickles down um, because the freshmen probably need the most modeling in terms of how to answer the questions. Uh, and then in addition with building relationships, we do a coaches dinner like over winter break. We're actually trying to schedule it. We're trying to schedule it right now. Um, so we do a coaches dinner every single year, and it's at, you know, like in the winter time, usually around Christmas, or right before the season starts during conditioning. Um, and one of the things that I like to really stress and kind of make sure the kids are aware of is like, tell them that you're doing a coaches dinner, and that y'all love working together, and that y'all are close, and you talk outside of practice, and that you do more than just lacrosse coaching. Um, so that bottom part is like posting the moments. So that coaches dinner, like all of the pictures I got through here are from our Instagram account. Um, and we have an Instagram account that anyone can follow and all the girls follow it. And it gives them like a, kind of like a timeline of like every time they look at it, like, oh yeah, that was so fun. I'm so excited about next season. Um, and they'll post on it kind of in the off season some things as well. Um, with that, our school is very cautious about creating the Instagram account that says Wesleyan on it. 
Um, I am the only person with passwords back now. I would not recommend giving high schoolers access to things that have your school's name on it. Um, especially if it looks like an official account, like ours has like the Wesley logo on it. Um, and so just be really cautious with that. And if you create something, you have to keep it up. If you're not keeping it up, you probably want to take it down. Because if someone's interested in your program and they find that account, it's not maintained. They're going to just, that might look not as good. Um, so just keep it fluid and then also make sure that it's appropriate. Um, and then during the season, we do multiple player dinners. This is something that we do all the way down through all of our teams. Um, for the varsity girls, like it's at my house, I know they do it at the coach's house for the JV dinners as well. It's not lacrosse talk, it's just them bonding with each other, talking, hanging out. Um, at the varsity level, you do one a month. Um, the JV level, I think they do two or three. At the middle school, they do like, I think two. Um, so it gets kind of smaller as you go down, especially if you have to have parents come and pick the kids up. Um, that also gets tricky, but you could also do like put that at the end of practice and, or just bring them popsicles and things like that, and that goes really well as well. At the varsity level, we do a team overnight event and we do lots of like team building stuff in terms of like sharing. We'll do a couple of the bucket stories at the retreat. Um, we'll do like and they really hated this at first, but I like brought popsicle sticks and like gumdrops and they had to build the top to call it tower. And they were like, this is so dumb, Coach Myers. And then like two minutes later, while they're doing it in their group, they were like, you know, having the best time of their life. So just make them do it. Like it might seem corny, but like they really want to be corny. They just want to be made to be corny. Um, they don't want to act like they want to do it in front of their peers. Uh, Anna, where do you do your overnight? You did it like a Players house or do you so we all one year we'll like go to Chattanooga and play a team in Chattanooga and we'll get like the cheapest hotel we can find and they'll be like weird stuff in the rooms and that's okay and that's a learning process and we'll talk about that um and then sometimes we'll go to like someone's house and like sleep on the floor and like just kind of wherever you can wherever you can find them. um so like we do a Tennessee game or like a South Carolina, like we'll do a game out of state every other year and then the other years we'll fill in with like just a retreat where the whole thing is just about bonding and doing like devotionals or telling stories or like having some sort of structure to that day but we'll alternate because there's some variety. Some girls really like the, the game, some girls really like the pure retreat. Um, <laughs> so it's good to do a variation of that. Uh, okay, expecting the best. This is my all-time favorite book. I read it when I was like in my first couple years of coaching and I've read it probably three times since then. Um, it is, everyone knows John Wooden, it's a pretty big, big deal. Um, he's a really great coach, but his thing as a coach was teaching fundamentals and teaching people how to be successful in life. It was not like, oh, let's do X and O's and let's teach them you know, this exact strategy and they'll be the best people ever. It was all about like literally on the first day of practice, he would take the kids into the locker room and tell them why it's important to put your basketball socks on correctly. Because if you don't put your socks on correctly, they'll bunch up and you'll get blisters, and then you can't play your best in the game. So it's teaching like why on the first day of practice do we practice the warm up that we're gonna do in front of other teams every time we show up for a game. And we spend a whole 90 minutes like going in the locker room, coming out of the locker room, teaching them that you have to run in two, two straight lines so that you look presentable when you go out to warm up on the field. And that there's no talking during warm up and why. And things like that. And it's really, he gets behind like, not just telling them what to do and that they have to do it perfectly, but why is it important to the bigger thing? Like if you don't do this well and give this your best effort, what are you gonna do at the next level when no one's gonna be there to motivate you to do your best or tell you that have to give your best performance every time you step um, So that, this book specifically, is five people, like John Wooden basically interviews and talks about five people who are most influential to him, and then five people that he mentored um, also speak and then basically give a story about like why he was important and changed their life. Um, it's an incredible book and it's a really easy read, again, it's probably like 100 pages, not super long. Um, but it gives you really focused on like, you know, I might not have the best team this year, but are my kids going to do the best they can? 
Um, and so that's kind of what our goal as coaches are every year um, <coughs> as we start. And then, oh, with that bottom part, just make sure like your goals for the team, like they're not goals for the team if they're not actually communicated to the team. Um, and so we talk like all the time, like we'll have games and I'll be like, look, like this is the goal. Like the goal is to do X, Y, Z. And we talk about it and then as, every time I give them a goal, we follow up on like, did you reach the goal? Sometimes we'll reward them. We'll be like, look, this is going to be a really tough game. If y'all can, we don't talk about like winning or losing the game, but I'll be like, if y'all can get 35 ground balls in this particular game, I'll knock five minutes off practice. And we will get a ton of ground balls. And they'll check in at the half. They'll be like, how many ground balls do we have, coach? I'm like, don't worry about the stats. And they're like, no, 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 like how many total, not me in particular. And so that is a really great way to motivate kids when you're going up against some really hard games. Because our first couple seasons, like, we would have to play some teams our region and just get our face beat in. And so that was one way to like really get them excited about like, well, if we play really well and we get a lot of ground balls, we get to leave like five minutes early from practice. Um, and honestly, like most of the time practice still ends at the same time, but they still <laughs> <laughs> um, So, so that's something that is great. Um, expecting the best, so we do a ton of conditioning um, in January. We do it for two hours every day after school. There's no sticks or anything involved. Um, but it is really hard. Um, this is where we walk those 20 something girls that first year that I was coaching as I was like, you know, conditioning is optional, but it's not really optional and you need to be there. Um, and if you're not doing anything. They were involved with swimming or involved with basketball. Obviously they didn't have to come out. Um, but we do a really difficult conditioning in January for four weeks, and it also leads into tryouts and things like that. The one thing um, that I would say is have a very specific plan, like sit down with your strength coach and know what a realistic time is, um, and know that they're going to complain the entire time. But they really do like the difficult days, like the last five minutes where I'm like, oh, let's stretch, we're done. They're like, I feel like I do so much. And I know like every morning I go work out and I like at the whole drive there I'm like, man, why am I doing this? But then you get there and they force you through the workout and then you finish and you feel great. Um, so just push them like if you don't, like I know I've seen like where we have an easier day and they're kind of like, oh, I feel like I could have just gone home and so we rarely have an easy day. Um, but they really do like it. If you can track their time, so we do like a mile run <coughs> the first week. And then if you can give them their feedback of like, hey, look, you trained really hard for these four weeks, and now you can run a mile, 30 seconds faster. Um, that gives them a lot of excitement in that, like, hey, I really can overcome this and do really well. Um, with varying the activity each day of the week, like, we do something totally different every day, but it's all running. Um, so it's like one day we're running stadiums, and we, like, make it really creative. We have to do things at, like, the bottom of the stairs, and it changes every day. And so that'll always kind of be like our Monday workout is like the stadium workout. And then one workout will be in the weight room where they're not doing weights um, because they're not all strong enough, but they'll do like ropes and like pushing boxes and like throwing medicine balls and things like that. Um, we don't do a ton in terms of like bar activities because it's very technical. Um, and then we'll do like a distance day where we just run a distance and then we'll do like a sprint day where we're up on the track doing all different limited sprints or we'll do like a cone drill day where they're changing direction. So keeping it very different, A, so that you're working different muscles, but B, so like that they don't get bored. If you do the same workout like more than once in a week, they're just like, oh, and very unmotivated to do it. Um, and then we also do a lot of small like devotional or inspirational moments. At the start. We change it up. It's not always at the start of practice. Sometimes it's when you feel like your students or your players are kind of like in a rut you'll pull them to the side and then just say something. The biggest help I have discovered with this is if you have a great assistant coach that, or any coach on your staff, I've had a couple years where it was just me, um, but changing the voice, whether it's asking your senior leaders to do the devotion or do the speaking or get people fired up, or it's one of your assistants, or it's you as the head coach, don't let it always be the same person because then it really just becomes muted out. Um, the year where I didn't have an assistant, it was definitely difficult. 
Um, but I had a great group of senior readers that you know really picked up, and those four girls I could talk to you all the time. So change the voice as often as possible, even if they're all saying the same thing. Um, and then evolving leadership. So we do, um, we try to get our varsity girls. So the picture on the left is the picture of the, they're in the Newtown League, I think, in this photo. But that's our like lower school. They do like a youth team. And so those are like run by the parents. Um, some, of, some of them have some cross knowledge, and some of them are just playing. And she is really great. Team players and stepping up and coaching in a sport that they have never played before. Um, but we have our high school girls sign up to come to some of their games on Saturday. We only let two go at a time. We send more than two. They're just going to cluster together and talk with each other. Um, but there is very clear outlines of like the first year we did it, we had a lot of issues that the coaches would be like, hey, the girls are just standing on the field with their cell phones. And like that's not really that helpful. Um, and I was like, oh, shoot. Um, and so then, like now, we talk like, leave your cell phone in the car. Don't even take your cell phone to the game. Um, what are you going to say to the girls when they come off the field? I know that, like, I think sometimes I got caught up with, like, oh, these girls look and talk, like, similar to me. Like, they must know all the things that I would do as a coach. But you really have to outline, like, what are you going to say to the girl when she comes off the, off the field right after she leaves the game? Like, are you going to say, oh, man, I can't believe you missed that goal? Or are you going to say, like, please hey, don't worry about it. It's for fun. Like, you did really, really great. Like, you have to outline exactly what you're going to say. They're high school kids. They really don't know what to say. Um, and so we talk about the type of feedback, and then we always follow up. And the big thing is, like, never assume. Like, the first time I did this and I sent some girls, I just assumed, like, that they were great players. They were going to give great feedback. Um, and that was not the case. So follow up with your youth coaches and kind of see what they're doing so that you can have a good idea of what you need to coach them up on. Um, and I also found like usually it's your players that don't get to play as much that are the best at doing this stuff. Um, sometimes the starters don't, don't hit it. Um, so, and then another way that we kind of evolve leadership is we do a spirit night, which is again where we bring that youth team into um, a varsity JV doubleheader. And so it's like basically like all girls <coughs> across connected to Wesleyan comes on one night. We give out <coughs> hot dogs because hot dogs are really cheap. Um, and so add all the kids and all the youth can like eat hot dogs for dinner. And then I think our JV team does like pizza. Our varsity girls are playing so they just play their normal game. Um, but what they do is they come to the campus and the JV team coaches the youth girls the middle school team runs the warm up for the youth girls, and then the youth girls play a game during the halftime. And I always email the coach that we're playing ahead of time, like, hey, are you okay with a 10 minute halftime? It might run over, it might really be 12 minutes. Um, but we have them put their uniforms on, they play each other, like, in the, in the halftime show. And then all the parents come, and there's a huge turnout, um, way more than any other turnout we have all season. Um, it gets your families really tied into like what is the goal. The biggest feedback I get from this one is like the younger parents are like, oh, I didn't know lacrosse was supposed to look like that. <laughs> they watch the parts of the game and then they get to see like what their kid will be able to do in the future, which is really awesome. Um, another thing we do is a service project every year. This is with our high school teams, the JV and the varsity. Um, you can just sign up at the Ronald McDonald House. It's very easy when you go. You take off an afternoon of practice and go and do a service project together. Um, when we do this, we give everyone very specific roles. Again, my first year I didn't do this and it was very hectic and very overwhelming. Um, but we like the ninth graders are responsible for setting up a craft for the kids that are eating dinner at the Ronald McDonald House. The sophomores are responsible for typically like taking kids on tours or like letting kids take them on tours around the Toronto McDonald house. The juniors are responsible for X, Y, Z items that they're going to eat and they have to cook it. And then the seniors get, you know, the main course dish. So they'll do like the chicken um, and things like that. And then whatever part you do, you also have to clean up. So the ninth graders have to clean up the craft. The 12th graders have to clean up the main dish items. Um, and that's a really great opportunity for our kids to see like what is it like to cook a meal and 
what is it like to work with people that aren't as fortunate as they are who get to go home and eat dinner and buy the cost that they're hearing. Um, so that leads to a lot of great conversation um, and it's a really great bonding activity for them. Um, summer camps, we have two to three girls from the varsity program that work summer camps. That is definitely a huge coaching opportunity to teach them how to be good leaders at a summer camp and things not to do at a summer camp and then getting them involved with the youth as well. And the youth love having those girls really invest into them at those. Um, the bottom one is very specific to varsity and to older players, but it could also be specific to a middle school team. So at the end of every spring, like the seniors are about to graduate, and this thing called senioritis is a real thing. We have our seniors, like by the end of the season, like they can become frustrating um, sometimes. And so when we get to like one of those moments where I feel like they are really frustrating, I actually like the seniors come to practice, they have no idea it's coming. And I'll just be like, can you skip day? And they like are all dressed and they're just like, yay! And they like leave. Um, and they get to go home. And then the juniors actually get to stay at practice and the whole practice I prompt them like think about what do you want to look like at the end of your senior season and how are you going to lead the team next year. Um, and then we end practice about 15 minutes early and they write a letter to themselves about what they want their senior year to look like. And I give them that, I hold it and I give it back to them at the start of the next season and they put it in their locker and like there was a point last year where the seniors, I was like, hey, why don't you go back and read your letter tonight? Like, are you doing this thing? Um, and it's a really great, like, it's them talking to themselves while they're seeing something that's really frustrating. Because when the seniors get like that, like, the whole team gets frustrated. Um, and the, they're kind of watching it and like, oh, man, I'm never going to be that kind of leader. But then they're seniors, and they start to fall back into that cycle. Um, and it typically happens after they know where they're going to college and they feel like the exams are no longer important. Um, and then the last part, this is something that I heard like recently, it wasn't that long ago, but the evolution of the word coach, even when I was now it's up there, it comes from the word stagecoach. Um, from like the 1600s and then it evolved like where we started calling people coaches in the 1800s. But that coaching is not just about like the finish point. The stage coach is like, how do you get there? Like there's tons of ups and downs, there's tons of days that look horrible, and there's tons of days that look amazing. But like, what are you doing as the coach to get them to that finished product, and how are you helping them and help, like helping them survive along the way? For them, the 1500s are like when they did stage coaches, like people would die on the journey. And it was the stage coach leader's responsibility to keep all those people safe. Um, and so I think for us as coaches, it's not necessarily like where you finish at the end of the season in the playoffs. It's how did you grow them along this long journey. Um, and I think you grow people most by having conversations with them and showing them how to lead. Like I would never expect something from my players that I don't do on my own. Um, and so talking with them about that and realizing that they know far less than you might assume looking at them. They look like they have it all together, especially with their technology and stuff, but um, that they really are struggling and looking for someone to, to teach them what is right from wrong. Um, and then the last piece is implementation. When I started eight years ago, like we did not do half, like we didn't do any of these things. Um, it was, it was it was, a mess. it was a growing process, and Amy and I worked through a ton of it together. So my biggest piece of advice is truly master things, like one thing each season. And once you master it, pass it on to someone else. Like have a parent be involved with you during the planning of spirit night, the first time y'all do spirit night, but you need to take full ownership over that first spirit night so that the parents can see like what you really want it to be. Um, and then the next year, like, have a parent run it, and you're just like, following up with them and making sure that they have everything in line. Um, so master just one thing a season. Never expect perfection. Like, the first time we did the bucket, it didn't go well. But you can, like, revise it and fix it and really grow it into something amazing. Nothing, if you wait for it to be perfect the first time, you're going to end up doing nothing is kind of my thought on being perfect. So. And then parent support, select lots of different people. Um, I know it's 
speaking with other coaches, I know a lot of people are, oh, I picked my best player because they get to play. I don't want to worry about playing time. But um, parents that have players that are not playing, let's say I find that I have a parent and I know their daughter is never going to play, but she is so supportive of what I'm doing. She is definitely one of my key moms because then when I have a parent of someone who's not playing, who's mad about it, that key mom in the stands will be like, oh yeah, but you know, it's really about this and it's really about building your child and not necessarily getting every minute in every game. So select different types of people because those parents that you select are also <coughs> sitting amongst your other parents and setting the tone for everyone there. Um, so that's really helpful. And then my parents send a weekly email where they highlight all the players. Um, and they just kind of say, you know, like, Susie did a great, great job and scored five goals and so and so scored her first goal of the season. And like, they send like a recap and then what the expectations for all the parents are for that coming week. Um, it really minimizes my communication with them, so then, which sometimes is a good thing. Um, and then team parent training, I always try to get someone from a different grade level so that I don't lose all my team moms in one year. Um, so like, if they're all seniors and they all graduate out, you're having to like restart the wheel with your parents the next year. I mean, you used to like only do senior moms, and I was like, this is a nightmare. No one's learning. And so now we have like a freshman one usually, and then like a junior one and a senior one. Um, and if the freshman wants, wants to stay her sophomore year, we let her. Um, we don't ever send them away. <laughs> so, but just like training your parents and <coughs> making sure that they're kind of ready and taking notes of what they want to change to the fall of the year. Um, with the youth leagues, it's really hard to get parents because obviously they graduate to the next level and then it's kind of over. So, any questions? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Um, I do feel like uh, when I showed up, it was like, I'm so excited to have a question. I was like, not in my slides. <laughs> um, but I do think through leading the girls and like being sportsmen as a coach and then expecting that from your players, um, that is super important in terms of like you have to have that relationship and you have to be doing the same thing before you expect your kids to do them. Um, but also I think in terms of that, the number one motivator for problems with players is playing time. Um, that's always the first thing to go. I remember we lost a couple games my first season because girls had bad attitude and so they didn't play the next game and we lost the game because of it and I'll tell you like losing that game was the best thing that we ever did because then now girls talk all the time and they're like she's not doing what she says she's going to do um, and so I will say playing time if you're having difficult children that don't want to do what you want them to do pull them off the field um, and that's my biggest piece of advice and that was more I like have not had to do that in years but in the beginning we had to do it a lot um, and they know you're not messing around. And that is the most important thing in the world to them. Just playing in front of here. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, I coach fifth and seventh grade girls. And the, the skill up between them is. I mean, in, in your experience, do you find getting some of your most experienced players teamed up with your less experienced players a better combination? Or do you find that the most experienced players sometimes get bored? There's and minuses. We have done like a great player with a not great player, and then like the player just getting cut. Like, <laughs> so like, it really, I mean, it depends on like how big of a spectrum you're talking about. I will tell you like the things that we do at the varsity level are the exact same things that we do at the middle school level. Um, because again, like only two to four of the girls, like, actually I don't know that we have ever had four at the same time, but like, we only have a couple that play at like the elite level. Okay. And the number one thing you can do is teach fundamentals so that every player on the field can catch. Like if you look at, and my husband and I talk about this all the time, he's a coach as well, but like if you just coach your like elite, so elite ones I usually like, I'm like, you're really good, you go over there. I'm gonna coach all these girls that are like in the middle and make them good so that you have someone to play them. So like you can't just leave those players that are behind behind because your elite players, like even the best coach, how much further are you going to bring them? Mm -hmm. And so I think with my mindset of like having a ton of girls that don't have experience is like bring the players that you need 
So language goes from one player up to the deck. Uh, and my girlfriend's like, we've had conversations about like, we don't have that many like, we like players and there's like a free turn. Like, we need to coach the ones that like have the knowledge to be able to hang with the other ones without getting hurt. Right, right. Uh, so I think at the varsity level, they're all mixed up and they have to make the team so they're all pretty good. Um, but at the middle school level, and you want to put you yeah, I, it's yeah, it's more you, so I you look at it like she says. I've got like a couple maybe that do travel. Down the girl, I had one girl last year from France could barely speak English and had never played sport in her life. So you got it, but you have to teach in the middle. So I teach the basics. This pretty in the beginning, the first month is like fundamental, fundamental. Then all of a sudden you see these girls. That French girl within a month was starting. I mean, it's just it's just you really push the fundamentals. And then what I do after because you do want to keep the higher level girls challenged. Right. So it's like the star drill, probably people know what the star drill is. I will separate the girls I know can handle at this level here and the newer girls here. And I'll let the assistant coach kind of watch the more advanced girls and I'm gonna focus on the new girls and try to get them up because really after that month, half of those girls in that first group are ready to be in the other group. And some of those girls, you don't know, they may be your best players. It would come to high school. So you'd want to give them that chance never letting them feel like don't ever put them with the best player to practice with because they will get hit because they don't understand you know they can't move you move that fast but um i i think that's that's worked for us and we have the retention of girls we maybe lose one girl every year because they just feel like they have a chance and that they belong so that seems to work for us Your best players don't feel valued, whether you say anything to them in practice or whether you never say anything to them in practice. They're good. Like, they can make you know, that'll be my advice. And if you see people ducking, they say, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I do think, like, we do tons of fundamentals. Like, everything we do at practice is basic. We have, like, six drills that we run through over and over and over again. If you constantly change the drills, and they're more focused on like, am I running to the right point? They're not going to catch the ball. So like, ha like at the lower level, when I was coaching middle school, like we had like five girls, we did the same five girls every single practice, and so they were all doing that. And they'd be like, why can't I play? And I'm like, you can't get the ball. Like, <laughs> um, so really, it's just fun to And like, what in that book that was up there, like all he does is play middle. So like, it's not about that team, but it's just being consistent. How do you get the team to hold each other accountable to the things that they can control on like attitude and effort? Um, I think I think if you have a couple girls that are really bringing the team down, like you hold the whole team accountable. because um, then the team gets on board with getting those girls on board. Uh, so everything we do is like full team penalty. Or I mean, if a girl shows up late and the one girl like wants an extra lap or whatever it is. Um, but like, if you have four girls that are bringing down the tone of the team, then you can, I've sent those four girls home before. I'm like, you don't want to be here, here's the door, leave and try to get to where you want to be. That was something that my high school coach used to tell me all the time, like, being here is a privilege. If you don't want to be here, like, go. Because it's better to get rid of those four keep the ones that want to be there than to try and find a way to make them excited. Um, that's something they really have to commit to. Um, but if you send them out and have a regular practice and then all the other girls go home and was like, well, practice is so great without you there, which they will say. Then like they come with a different tone the next day. Um, and so I've done that and then like, you know, I meet with them the next morning, like, is this really what you want to do? Because if you're going to come to practice like that and I have to send you home again, you're like, you're out. Like you can't come back. Um, and so, but you actually have to like, you actually have to do it. So you actually have to sit home. You actually have to bench them. Because if they get sent home from practice, they have to sit the first half of the next day because they weren't at practice. Um, and so that's also like a driver there. But once you get that culture really set, like we don't have any of those issues anymore. Like I mean, occasionally we'll have some issues, but it's it's a totally different ballgame than when we first started. Remember, I when we first started, like it was like how many girls have to sit for the game. Um, and you show up to a game with like a sub and, and you have you have to still play.
players the ones that are left. Because otherwise, the ones that are left will be like devastated and feel totally devalued if you want to go up with the 12 that you have to play. Do you have a suggestion on how to implement something similar at a rec level where everybody's supposed to get equal playing time and you can't bench girls because the parents are going to go complain to the rec league that, hey, I paid and, you know, my daughter's not playing? Um, I would say, like, you could toy with the position at which they play because you know where they want to play. Yeah. Um, but they don't have to play there. And then playing time. That would just be my, like, thought. I have never coached a <coughs> I've never coached to like a rec, yeah. like pay to play league. Mm -hmm. uh, when I coached rec, we would like, you know, because we change the starters every okay. week. Mm -hmm. okay. And if you were, you know, consistently late or had a bad or whatever, then we would just say, you know, you were supposed to start today, but you're not going to start okay. because, you know, you were late for five or you didn't join five to So, and yeah, they're still playing, yeah. but they didn't get to start, you know. That's mm -hmm. the most important piece, yeah. though, is explaining to them why they're not starting. Mm -hmm. If you just don't start them, then it's like they have no idea why, and then they're just mad at you because you didn't start them because you don't like them. <laughs> Versus, like, having the conversation of you missed X, Y, Z, or you didn't win at practice, it has to be really clear. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what's the
So give her a second to get her stuff put together. If you want to come down and get handouts, go to the bathroom or get water, whatever.